I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. It is so awesome to serve the living and the true God that never changes. We have that assurance in his word. He said, I am the Lord God that changes not. Jesus tells us in Hebrews that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, today I'm bringing you a brand new word. It's a prophetic word for the nation because we're seeing here in America how uh, there's a spirit. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, we're t warned about that in John's epistle how the Antichrist spirit was there in their day in 2,000 years ago, and now we're seeing it uh, emerging in many ways, in many forms in our society in America. It's trying to redefine things. So the Lord gave me a word for America. It's entitled The Redefinition of Love. And it comes out of the very familiar scripture of John chapter 3, both in 16, verse 16 and verse 19, where God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Verse 19 it says that men love darkness rather than light. And there's two types of love mentioned in that. And today's teaching will expound more on that. So you stay tuned, get the word of God out, and let's hear what the Spirit has to say today. I want to welcome our television audience and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Lord has given me a prophetic word for the nation of America, for the church in America. It's entitled, The Redefinition of Love. Look there in Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Can you say amen there? Amen. I did not come to destroy the law, to, to destroy, but to fulfill it. For assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, by no means shall pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore, watch this, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, that scripture, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, talking about the law and the prophets, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He's pretty emphatic there, isn't he? Now, when Jesus came to earth, we're told in John 1 that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Remember that? He didn't come with his own agenda. But he came to destroy the works of the devil and to speak the truth that he may expose the lies of Satan. Because when you're deceived, you can believe about anything. But whenever deception comes off, then you have some checks in your spirit. Right? It, it, it sounds nice. It sounds kumbaya-ish. <laughs> but it, it, there's something there just don't click with my spirit. That's discernment. Don't believe everything. Test the spirits. Try them. See if they're of God. God gives us that right. Amen? So, so Jesus, when he came, he did not come with his own agenda. He did not come to destroy. Uh, he came to destroy the works of the devil and to speak the truth to expose the lies of Satan. Now, he also came to remove the veil from the hearts of his people, God's chosen people, so that they could clearly see and understand what truth is according to God's law and God's prophets. Now, what Jesus literally was doing on a, a, a low, uh, uh, on a much clearer understanding, was he was coming to dispel the fog that had filled the synagogue, the political correctness, if you would, of his day. He came to dispel that and get it out. Now, Jesus told the Jews in John eight, and you will remember it, that. As he was preaching, many believed on him. You remember that story? And he told those who believed on him, If you will continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. You shall continue, if you continue in the word, you shall come to know the truth that I have taught, and that truth will make you free, right? So Jesus came to bring the truth. He came to set the record straight. And if they would believe on that as the Jews and continue in that teaching, that, that teaching of truth, 
that constant diet of truth would eventually set them free from the deceptive lies of the enemy that had placed them in bondage. When you're deceived by the enemy, what you don't realize is you've been put into bondage to a lie. And that lie is warring against you and pulling you down and, and sucking the life out of you. When the truth comes, it, it, it hurts, it stings because you're believing something other than the truth. And so you find out how wrong you were. But if you'll believe that truth and adhere to that truth and accept it, that truth will set you free and you'll start experiencing a, a uh, blessed life. Now, so the intent or the motive behind Jesus coming to earth being full of grace and truth was for the sole purpose of setting us free from sin and the deceptive power of Satan. And Satan did not like Jesus very much. Matter of fact, he hated him for that. He sought to kill him when he was born through Herod. He sought to kill him many times because at the hands of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the elders of, of his own people. Satan hated him because... He, 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 pro, he preached the truth. And when the sinners got a hold of that truth and got set free from it, it turned Jerusalem upside down. And they hated that because the, the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees and the elders, they were losing control. Even Rome was losing control. And it, it alarmed them. Think about this. I don't know how long Israel was in Egypt before it went from bad to worse meaning there rose up a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph but from that point on that Pharaoh used Jews like a slave to build his empire to become one of the greatest empires at that time and so Jesus God sends Moses in there just like Jesus was sent into Jerusalem to turn that, that world upside down. And Pharaoh hated Moses. The taskmasters hated Moses. And by the time Israel got beat more, that were, were forced to make bricks and gather their own stuff to make those bricks, Israel was turning its, its back on Moses. But God spoiled that kingdom. See, God does not want us building the world's empire. God's got us here to build his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have, we have something we've got to do here. It's a kingdom assignment. Now, while you had Jesus speaking the truth, living out the truth, on the other hand, we have the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, except your righteousness, he sees the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So we have the scribes and the Pharisees who, by the way, had an agenda of their own. Jesus did not have his own agenda. He says, I came to do the Father's will. Isn't that refreshing? Have somebody in office that does not have an agenda except to govern the people. They sought, these scribes and Pharisees sought to redefine God's law and to establish their own righteousness. Does that sound familiar? They sought to redefine God's law, interpret it. They were lawyers, Pharisees. And by the way, these Pharisees were not sanctioned of God. Where did they come from? They're not mentioned in the Old Testament. In Malachi, it was the prophets, there were judges, and there were kings. But between Malachi and Matthew, now you have uh, Pharisees and Sadducees that are leading the people of God. And they interpreted the law. This is what God meant when he said this. But their hearts were not of God. They were not for God. And they did not teach truth that pertained to God's ways. So they misled that generation. So God says, wait a minute. This thing's getting off on the wrong foot. So he sends Jesus down to set the record straight. You Pharisees, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven because your righteousness is not of God. It's self-righteousness. People, don't listen to what the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are telling you because it's wrong. 
They sought to redefine God's law and establish their own righteousness. This is the reason why the Jews and the leaders of Judaism rejected Jesus as their Messiah and is found in Romans 10. Turn with me to, to that. I'm giving you scripture to back up everything I'm saying so that you understand the ways of God and that this is not my sermon, this is God's word for you from his heart. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish, say it with me, their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Romans 10 tells us exactly why Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It tells us why the scribes, the Pharisees, and the elders, and the Sadducees rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They did not want to adhere to God's law the way God intended it. They wanted to twist the law and justify their own sin. I should have got better amen right there. Going about to establish their own righteousness, they would not submit to the righteousness of God. Are we not seeing that today? Absolutely. Turn back with me to Matthew 5, 21. Now watch Jesus. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and, what, and whoever says to his brother, Rekha, uh, sh shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, you shall be in danger of hellfire. Woo! Boy, he scorched them, didn't he? Now, this discourse, watch how it progresses. He says, whoever breaks one of these, the least of these commandments, and teaches men to do so will be least in the kingdom. Whoever teaches them and does the, the, the law, they, they are great in the kingdom. And, and he goes on and says, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we by no means will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes into this, setting the record straight. You have heard of old, but I say unto you. Immediately after Jesus addresses the error of the scribes and the Pharisees' beliefs, Jesus begins to correct the erroneous teachings that the Jews had heard and had adhered to as God's people. Throughout the Gospels, we read many examples of where Jesus exposed the lies and the false doctrines of the religious rulers of the Jews, and then he would tell the Jews what the truth was. You have heard it said this way, but I say unto you, it is this way. Right? See, it is not my intent to stop the evil agendas of man. All I can say is throw up on the screen what they have said and go to the scripture and say, but God says it's this way. Now you've got to choose who you're going to believe. Now, Jesus was not redefining the truth. But he was establishing the truth so it could be then fulfilled as a witness to the Jews so that they would have no excuse for their sins. That's good. The, the scribes and Pharisees had an agenda. We're going to redefine the law. We're going to redefine the meaning of things. And we're going to create our own world absent of God's rules and regulations. In a utopia where everybody is free. Right? And Jesus comes and disrupts all that. You're not building a utopia. You're building a prison. And you're holding people in bondage. You won't go in and you won't let them go in. Isn't that what he said? Turn with me to John 15. But Jesus did this through the preaching of the truth. I covered this last week, but it, it bears repeating. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you, Jesus is speaking. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, guess what? 
they're going to per persecute us. If they kept my word, they will keep your word also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. So all this uh, retribution, all this persecution against the church, it's only because the world does not know the Father. They do not know Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we say we speak in the name of Christ, they say we don't know that God you say you call on. What, what happened when, when uh, Moses went in there to Pharaoh and said, God has said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has said, let my people go that they may uh, worship me in the wilderness. And he's like, I don't know your God. Moses, look, I could see Moses right there, his little wheel spinning and say, no, but before this is over, you're going to know him very up close and personal. <laughs> the world does not know our God, so they see us as having an agenda of our own. But what they don't realize is we've got the kingdom of God backing us up. So when we speak the word in truth and love, God's there with his kingdom to back us up. So don't get timid. Don't draw back. Don't shrink back. Don't silence your voice as a Christian. Cry loud and spare not. God is with you. Right? So he says, if they persecute you, me, they're, they're going to persecute you. But all these things they will do for my name's sake, because they have not known him, the Father who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would uh, have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause, simply for telling them the truth. Now, as Jesus spoke the truth to the Jews throughout his three and a half years of ministry on earth, many believed his teachings and were born again. Yet there were others who rejected the truth and hated Jesus for exposing their sinful ways. Now, they hated Jesus. Get this. This is why they hated Jesus. I've given you scripture. Simply because he told them the truth that had the power to save their soul from hell. You know, I, I want to invest in, in some, uh, I'm speaking hypothetically. I want to invest in stock, and I talked to my friend the other day who's, who's a stockbroker, and he says, you don't want to do that because that thing's going to go into the tank not many months because they're making bad decisions in the upper echelon of their corporate world, and so you don't want to do that. And so I, I, I began resenting him because I really wanted to invest in this stock. And so I just slammed the phone down on him. I told him I did not want to talk to him anymore because of his counsel. I went ahead and invested in it, and guess what happened? It happened exactly the way he said. And that's what they did to Jesus. He told them the truth. They had the power to save their soul from hell. And, and they shut the phone down. I don't want to hear what you got to say. And guess what? When, when they died, they found a rich man down there. Why did they hate Jesus when he loved them enough to tell them the truth? Think about that. Oh, this is going to get good. Why did they hate Jesus when he loved them enough to tell them the truth? We know from the woman in, in John 8 that was caught in the act of adultery. Get this in your spirit, y'all. We know from that story where she was caught in the very act, the scribes and the Pharisees drug her out of that adulterous bed and brought her before Jesus and told her, him what was going on. We know from that, that story that Jesus did not condemn her. Did he? Who was condemning in that situation? The scribes and the Pharisees. Isn't that something? How Jesus did not condemn them, her, but the scribes and Pharisees were ready to stone her and had rocks in their hands. Isn't this something how the world, the Pharisees of the world, are accusing us of being haters, intolerant, and standing in the way of their agenda, and they're the ones with the rocks in their hands. But it was Jesus 
who did not condemn her. I want you to get that in your spirit because we are getting blasted on every side for being the ones who are hating sinners and condemning sinners. When it says, says condemn someone, you're the, the judge, you're the jury, and you're the executioner. And you're the one that's going to send them to hell. None of us has that power. But yet let them, the world, the, the religious Pharisees of the world, find out we got some sin in our, our lives, buddy, they jury, judge, executioner, and condemn us to hell. There's no hope for us. Right? But Jesus did not condemn the sinners while he was here. Matter of fact, do you remember when he was eating with the sinners and the scribes and Pharisees caught wind of that? Who does he think he is? He's eating with publicans, which is sinners, tax collectors. And they're over there looking down their long religious nose at him. How deceived can you be that you're calling us one thing when in fact we're not that, but you're the one that is doing that? That's exactly what they were doing. That's what they're doing today. They're accusing us of being one way when in fact it's them that are being that way, and we're just trying to speak the truth in love. Amen. Amen. Amen? Had he not told them the truth, they would have had no conscience of sin. But because he told them the truth, they had no covering for their sin. So they had opportunity to get rid of their sin. So why is it that uh, Jesus did not condemn sinners, yet they hated him? Turn with me to John three sixteen. Remember the title is the redefinition of love. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. If you truly love, you will give. God so loved the world that he gave his only choice, precious, valuable, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not, it says did not, right? Send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Yeehaw, we're not condemned. But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is what you need to put on social media, those who are on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. This is the condemnation. This is where the world is feeling the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil does what? Hates the light and does not come to the light. Don't attend church lest his deeds should be exposed. Ruh row. But he who does the truth comes to church, comes to the light, comes to Christ, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done or wrought in God. Now get this. In this scripture, I've never caught it before, there are two types of love mentioned in these verses. There's the love of God, and there's the love of the world. Hashtag, love wins. That's the love of the world. We as Christians have the love of God. God loved sinners so much that he willingly gave his son for our sins. Right? He loved us. Jesus Loved the Father so much that he willingly gave his life to carry out the Father's will. He loved the Father more than life itself. Did he not? 33 year old. Then you have the love of the world mentioned in verse 19. The love of the world isn't based on giving, but on getting. I want my way. There's only one way, and it's not Jesus. It's my way. 
The love of the world isn't based on God, but it's rooted in self. According to Jesus, those who love evil and darkness also hate light and truth. Now, last week, the Lord calls verse 19 to literally explode in my spirit with clear revelation. It's not the truth that condemns sinners of their sins. It's the fact that they hear the truth and they see the light of God, but they love evil and darkness more because their hearts and their deeds are evil. That's it. So when, so when you post something on Facebook and somebody in the world goes off on you, then you found the target. You need to pray for that person. You don't need to get in there and, and start cussing them out. You don't need to get on a personal level with them because if they rejected you, they rejected me. See, don't make it personal. Get in there and say, I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God opens up the eyes of your understanding so that you're enlightened because right now you're not. I am certain by the Spirit of God that this has been ministering to you. It is a prophetic word, and there is so much more to this that we're going to share in the second segment of the redefinition of love. Uh, the sermons that God has been giving me uh, since the passing of the law uh, for same-sex marriage by the Supreme Court has been some of the most important and revelational messages that God has given me in recent time that is helping answer questions for Christians who are confused about what is going on and how the change is taking place in our society and how we as Christians are to respond scripturally. That's the way Jesus taught us how to do it. And that's the way we as Christians are to do it because we follow his ways, not the ways of the world. Paul tells us in Romans 12, uh, be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we're not conformed to the ways of this world. And so the scripture does that through the Holy Spirit, revealing that word to us, making it alive. Before I leave you today, I want to invite you to sit down and send us an email. Let us know where you're watching us from. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know how this ministry, in some areas, we're new to the area, and so we want to hear how this ministry is affecting you and helping you, impacting your life through the Word of God that's being taught. We'd love to hear from you. The information is at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to contact us for a CD or a DVD, that contact information will also be there. If you'd like to sit down and send us an email about a prayer request or a praise report of what God has done for your life through the prayers of our, our ministry joining with you in faith for your needs, please do that at prayer at whcnorth.org. So until this time next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512.